Here's the moment you've been waiting for. The doors are officially open for pre-sale of the Blackset Global Move Abroad course. Yes, the course you've been waiting for to give you the step-by-step process for moving abroad minus the overwhelm. We cover everything from choosing the right country, understanding visas, getting your money together, and moving abroad with ease. Go to the link in the description of the episode that you're listening to, but don't wait because the pre-sale price changes on September 7th. The door is officially open to the course September 26th, so make sure you get inside and we'll see you then. Close your eyes and imagine living a life you love, unapologetic and unbothered, free from daily microaggressions from Karens and Kens, free from the fear of police brutality and systemic racism. Wouldn't that feel amazing? Now open your eyes. What if I told you that it's possible? Hear inspiring stories and get the actual blueprints from brothers and sisters of the diaspora who are living out their wildest dreams abroad. You've heard the term, now be inspired by the movement. I'm Krishan Wright, and this is Blacksit Global. I am really, really excited about this episode and conversation for the Blacks of Global podcast because I have the honor and the pleasure to have an in-person conversation, oh my gosh, with a Black in Portugal. I am in Lisbon, Portugal doing my scouting trip and have the honor and the privilege to talk to these amazing, amazing human beings that have created pathways for us to land comfortably in Portugal. So, Without further ado, you guys won't be able to see, but you will hear their beautiful voices. So they will take turns introducing themselves. All right. Hi, my name is Heather, and I'm originally from Jersey. I've been living in Portugal for eight months now, and I love it. I am the director of events uh, within the Black and Portugal community. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. BK stands up. Um, I've been living in Lisbon now. I moved here at the beginning of the year with my husband, and I am the events manager. Hey, everyone. I'm Cam, and I'm from Michigan. I've been in Lisbon almost 10 months now. Wow. (laughs) Time is flying by. And I'm the community growth lead. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna. I arrived in Lisbon, this is going on my six months, so I'm fairly new. Um, I'm from the DMV, and I'm social and brand manager for Black in Portugal. Awesome. And you all know me, Krishan, from the Boogie Down originally, mm-hmm. holding space in Jersey till it's time for my Black sit. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was planning moving to Portugal, I was searching on Facebook for a Black in Portugal type of group. And I stumbled across Black to Portugal, and that was the group. It only had about 80 people, but I joined, and I reached out to the founder, Caden, said, hey, if you need any help with, like, admin stuff, because the group started to grow, and we started to get to, like, 200. She was like, yeah. And then as time progressed, she decided not to move to Portugal anymore. So I took over, and I noticed that Heather was putting on a lot of events, and I was like, we need to collab together. And then... I was like, Ashley's doing the same thing. She's coming. And then Anna is amazing at social media. So we all just came together because we all have like a vision and our different strengths. And so it's been an amazing team. Oh, my goodness. I just and when I see it, everything's on point, like between the events, the social media and the actual going to the events, you know, I'm like. So excited for tonight, the trivia night. Don't know what to expect. I'm like, is this going to be like Jeopardy type trivia? Is this going to be like culture trivia? Like, you know. <laughs> culture. Okay, because I'm like, there's so much in my brain. I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready. The big thing is the energy. The energy that somebody who's on the receiving end in the United States, in New Jersey, I see it and I feel it. And so I just want you all to know that you're doing a fabulous job and it's greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. you. So I really want to know what was the impetus for, because you all are still in the early, like less than a year time in Portugal. What was it that called you here? 
Okay, I'll go first. Okay. All right, so originally Portugal, Lisbon was my first city I ever visited internationally. And I did not think I would ever come back here, but somehow now I'm living here. So when I chose Portugal, I was looking at several factors. I was looking at the cost of living. I was looking at how easy it was to get a visa uh, and become a resident. And also I have a daughter, so she wanted to go to college in Europe and I wanted somewhere that was affordable where she would be able to transition into European schools uh, while we were here. Wow. And how old's your daughter? Uh, she'll be 15 in August. Oh, okay. Wow. That's awesome. I first came to Lisbon when I was doing a travel program and really love the vibe here and that it's a low cost city with like a great quality of life and also that it's diverse um because it's very important for me <laughs> if i'm going to be in europe to be where you know my people are so that was a huge huge factor in the decision but also my husband is from the uk and lived in spain for more than a decade and really likes the lifestyle of southern europe and he wasn't interested in moving to america because of the guns or whatever so here we are and also uh portugal i think is ranked like number three or four in the safest countries in the world so that's also great so yeah that's why yeah. i'm here <laughs> i feel like my story is a little bit different I never visited Portugal before I moved here. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> which is kind of a scary thing to do, but I was leaving Thailand in the beginning of 2020 and trying to figure out what my next move was going to be. And I knew being in the States wasn't it like at all. And so I was like, where can I go where I'll have community? Because I like that in Thailand. I wanted to be around people that look like me. I wanted to be able to assimilate into a culture and so my sister was like, I think you really like Lisbon. Like, it's diverse, lots of Black people, it's affordable. And then I started looking things up, and I was like, okay, in five years, I can be a permanent resident, and that can turn into dual citizenship. And then the cost of living is relatively affordable. So I'm like, okay, affordability, people that look like me, um, easy access to the U.S. or other countries that I want to be visiting. So I was like, it's a win-win for me. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what really ultimately made me move here or desire to move here. Sight unseen. Yeah. <laughs> very, very brave. We love it. <laughs> very, very cool. <laughs> um, so I came to Lisbon in 2019 for my birthday, I think my 25th birthday. And at the time, it was literally the cheapest place for me to fly from D.C. to Europe. So I was like, you know what? That's where I'm going to go. <laughs> um, I knew nothing about Portugal, nothing about Lisbon. Um, but I arrived, and similar to how you said, the third by the third day you knew. Like, mm -hmm. literally, once I got here, something just clicked. Yeah. Um, and I had been looking, similar to what you said, I had been looking for places to move. But I was thinking of, like, New York and not really D.C. because I used to live there as well and uh, San Diego and just, like, all the major cities in the U.S., and at the end of the day, it was the U.S., so I knew I didn't I didn't want to stay. So when I came here and everything kind of fell into place and clicked, I was like, you know what? I think this could be this could be it for me. So um, two years later, I'm here. All your stories are inspiring, inspiring to me since I'm towards the tail end of my scouting trip. And it's been real <laughs> just being able to go outside the U.S. and feel, like I said, on my third day, I knew and I felt it in my heart more so than my head. And I think you feel it in that heart space when it's that one. Being here has exceeded my expectation. And I think the thing that really struck home to me was the sense of community. Let's talk a little bit about that community. It is one thing to go to a, a new country and to meet Black and Brown people that look like you. It's a different thing to go and then have a community of Black and Brown people. I think there's a distinction. So how important was it to formulate a community here? Um, so for me, before I moved to Lisbon, I was living in Mexico, and there was a Facebook group for here in Lisbon. I noticed there wasn't really much going on. I mean, people were posting, but there wasn't anything as far as meetups or events or anything. Um, and I said, you know, wherever I end up next, I have to have a community. I have to have somewhere where I can thrive, where I can have people that I can rely on you know, my extended family away from family. Mm -hmm. So when I arrived here in August, I think maybe that first week I was 
I was here, I had a brunch. And that's where I met Ashley and Cam at. They came to a brunch. Oh my gosh. There's 11 people <laughs> that came. And, you know, we started this WhatsApp group. And that's where, like, the community started to build, you know, exclusively for Black women and women of color. And then I just started having events. And then more people, you know, we started meeting people. And then that's how the community grew for me. Um, it's really important because when you're away from your, you know, family, it's kind of hard. You know, you don't have anyone you can call, talk to. If an emergency comes up, your family can't just, you know, drive down the street or be in the cab, you know, in a few minutes. So definitely having a reliable community that's not only positive but uplifting mm-hmm. and that supports you is really important to me. Yeah, community is really important for me because that's what makes a place feel like home. Yes, I was at Heather's brunch and also (laughs) (laughs) I met people too because of that same Facebook page that she was talking about. Like when I came, I was just like, hey folks, I'm here. And it was over the summer, so we were kind of coming out of COVID, but not really. So I was like, I'm happy to meet people outside because, you know, (laughs) I don't want to get the Rona. Um, (laughs) And it was just like, instant connections because I think that a lot of people are in the same wavelength Mm -hmm. just you know when my friends back home they're like how did you make so many friends so fast and I'm like I think because everyone comes here without friends Mm -hmm. so they're just like open Mm -hmm. and ready to like build communities so um because we all have that shared experience and it's strong connections with people like Heather was saying to echo off what she's saying that you can depend on like I've definitely made like hospital runs with friends or mm-hmm. you know just being there for people since our families are not down the street mm-hmm. it's powerful it is and for me family is more chosen than it is blood like I do have family members that I you know consider family but being here I've been able to like cultivate a group where I feel like they are my family like I can call on them like people are like can I support you or do you need anything? And people here show up in a way that I've never been shown up for before. And it's refreshing. Like the lady said before, people are genuine here. And the first week that I got here, I met people and made friends. And this place is something special. And I think the community is one of the reasons why people really feel at home here. Because Portugal, it's a great country, but it can be difficult to navigate sometimes because of the bureaucracy and just being able to have our WhatsApp group or our Facebook group where we're like reaching out to people like, hey, have you done this before? Could you help me with this? And everybody like shows up and shows out and they care about you. So it's incredible that we have this group where we're just able to show up for each other. And the Facebook group, I was one of the first people in it and we only had like 80 people and now we have like 3,000 plus. So it's just wow. been able, like just being able to see it grow mm-hmm. and blossom and also being able to integrate with other black people that aren't necessarily American that are from like Lissafone countries or from other European countries. It's been a, it's been an amazing thing. Because you never really know the imprint that you're making on, on someone else's journey. You guys are lighting it and making it easier for the next person who's either coming over or, or who has settled in and is trying to figure out, like, where do I go? What's the best doctor? You know, all mm-hmm. those things that come along for the ride. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I echo all of the sentiments that these ladies have said. I really can't imagine having gone through this transition without a group like this. Like, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't even want to think about it. It would have been terrifying, especially like Cam and I, like we came over by ourselves. I mean, I came with my dog, but like we're here by ourselves. And for me, um, I, I was, I tried to be a lot more intentional about like putting myself out there and meeting people. And I'll never forget literally my first week here, I, I got here like the Monday and then the Thanksgiving event was Thursday. Mm-hmm. So to get, for that to be my first week and my first introduction and like touch point to not only Portugal, but the black community in Portugal, it was the warmest welcome. And I met so many people that I'm obviously still connected with today. So again, just having this soft place to land and there's mm-hmm. so many challenges like Cam alluded to, like everyday struggles and obviously acclimating to the culture. So all of that is already hard, but to have this space that's consistently safe and soft, it, it just makes me the transition that much easier. Mm, I love that soft place to land. So we talked about some of the things that don't make the gram of most expats, right? The bureaucracy, obviously we're in a country that English isn't the first language, although it is spoken in Lisbon. 
how have you been able to adjust to the language? I mean, I've been here almost two weeks. I've been getting by, <laughs> but that's that. it has an end date for me, right? So you all are here. So what's it been like? For me, I feel like it has been difficult um, to learn the language because although like I don't speak Spanish fluently, the sounds I make when pronouncing Portuguese words are more Span- Spanish than Portuguese, so they don't really understand uh, or don't want to try to understand. Uh, another problem that I have been finding, but I kind of found a solution, is when the white Portuguese people speak, they speak very nasally and in their throats, mm-hmm. and I can't make those sounds because they're not normal sounds in English language. But I notice when the black well, Portuguese people speak Portuguese, uh, it's more understanding because they're not as nasally or mm-hmm. in their throat. Um, but I have been taking Portuguese lessons um, with a tutor from Miguel Gustavo as a teacher, and it has been helping, but it's still a struggle, definitely. So I'm in my second Portuguese class, and class is challenging. However, I am trying. What has made it a little easier to help me navigate through the bureaucracy as well, like my husband speaks Spanish fluently, and Portuguese people for the most part, understand Spanish. They love to say that Spanish people don't understand Portuguese. (laughs) Um, And then one of my really good friends here is a native Portuguese. Um, Her and I met in the States in 2017. So she's been like so helpful with us for some of like our appointments and stuff. So it's, it's great to have like a friend who is, like, local. I definitely agree. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. So I was was dating someone that was from South May, and so, like, any administrative things, I would be like, okay, can you handle that for me, please? I don't know. Like, I would get a random phone call, and somebody would be speaking to me in Portuguese, and I wouldn't even know what was going on. But there are some similarities to Spanish as far as, like, the words itself, but the pronunciation is different. And the conjugation might be a little bit different too. So it is challenging even doing Duolingo, that's Brazilian Portuguese, but other former Portuguese colleagues, they speak sweeter Portuguese, I would say. Like it's softer. And so it's easier to learn. And I would say if you're trying to learn Portuguese, maybe learning like Brazilian Portuguese would be an easier like segue into it. But I just know how to say the basics. (laughs) The basics are important. Look, yeah. I'm an old la bombilla, so I went to death. <laughs> or no, no, I follow do. Google Portuguese. No, uh, follow Google Portuguese. Yeah, it's interesting. So we just posted a question on our pages a few weeks ago asking people, like, what do you wish you knew before you got to Portugal? And I had posted, like, I really wish that I had started learning sooner, that I took it more serious before I arrived. So I started like maybe nine months before I got here and I also was using Duolingo at first and like three months into it realized it was Brazilian. I was like, okay, well now I have to start all over. So I switched over to memories, but I definitely wish that I had taken it more serious sooner. And once you get here, there's like multiple steps that you have to then take to securing like your residency and whatnot. And just like having to correspond with people. Sometimes I sense their frustration on the other end when I'm like trying to speak Portuguese and they're like, oh, you speak English. Like there's definitely like a little bit of frustration and like a little tense sometimes. Um, And I will say it's hard because I mean, obviously to me, like the best way to learn is by like fully immersing yourself. So when I go out, I'm like trying to talk to people, but not everyone is as, you know, welcoming and accepting of it. Like as soon as they hear me struggling through the Portuguese, they just immediately start speaking English. And I'm like, well, that's not going to help me. (laughs) So right now, like I said, I'm using memories and I definitely want to take an in-person class like many of us do. But bottom line is it's a challenge. Like it's, it's very much a challenge. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Ross, the host of Smells Like Humans, a show about interesting and quirky human behavior. We bring humor, empathy, and warmth to topics such as relationships, dating, work, self-compassion, weddings, phobias, aging parents, travel mishaps, death, and many more. Ever wonder what happens at a cuddle party? We talk about it. Free-range kids in restaurants? We've got some thoughts. Bedtime stories for adults? We're on it. Light, fun, unscripted conversation and personal stories. Please join us by clicking the link in the show notes.
before I get into the questions that came in from the Blacks at Global community, some obvious questions as Black women. <laughs> What's it like trying to find the stuff that we need for our hair, you know, services and things like that? Or do you see that it's something that you can get within relative ease and or what do you see as a potential opportunity for things that maybe could be here to service the community that much better? So I guess I can talk about hair products. I think a lot of people don't realize that Portugal has a lot of Black people. The African presence is very strong here. So that being said, African women need ethnic hair products. Mm -hmm. So you can find hair products just about anywhere from the metro stations to different corner stores. There's actually one, two major areas, one in Colombo Mall, outside Colombo Mall at the, the bus station. It's a whole row of vendors with hundreds, if not thousands of hair products. And to Mayel, uh, the big jars, the Eco Styler gel, the, the stuff you spray for wigs. Well, maybe I need What's to go back to the Because I've just been using them. Meridil and oil. Yeah, yeah. That's good. A lot of major brands are out there. As I Am is another one. Wow. Um, so it's out there, and there's so many different varieties. I do suggest, if you have time, don't go get don't buy it from the metro station because they're mm -hmm. a lot more expensive. But if you go to Colombo Mall or anywhere um, in Almeida, which is a city like outside of Lisbon, mm -hmm. which is where a, a large amount of, you know, the black people do live there. So there's stores for everything. There's also hair here, hair, like braiding hair. Mm -hmm. I will say I feel like the quality isn't as great as it could be in the States. Um, but there's also another place in uh, Abolina. Abol I'm sorry, do you know the name? Abolina? Obolina? It's a mall called Obelina or Abelina, oh. and it's literally floors and floors and floors of hair braiders, barbers, weaves, okay. tracks. <laughs> what? It's Am Amadora. I think it's, Am Amadora. it's right, out, right by Amadora in the same area. Okay. And it's just levels and levels and levels and levels. You know, if you can't find your blonde weed number 35Z, <laughs> you can go right here and get it. The access to get these hair products, you can get them here. However, if you have a certain brand such as like Onion Handmade, Back in the States, you know, I would suggest you buy it and bring it over here. You most likely are not going to get it. Although some suppliers do ship internationally, but those custom rates, oh. custom and duty fees, 23%, I believe it is. What? It's not worth it. Yeah, oh. it's not worth it. That's a wrap. So I had initially brought some hair products with me until I found, or this group actually <laughs> recommended my hairstylist. Thong, our, our, our hairstylist. Thong. Yes. <laughs> I'm a little sad. He's back in Brazil right now for until the end of the month. So, you know, I've been having to do my hair myself. But I have a standing appointment with him once a week, get my wash and set, get my treatment. Ashley does not do her hair no more. Mm -hmm. I am living my best black girl luxury life. <laughs> but for the low low. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's my answer. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I got my hair twisted since I was here and for a fraction of what mm -hmm. I paid back home. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. It was it was unreal. I would be having it done all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really easy to find stuff. When I was living in the Hoyish, I walked past the store and saw all the hair products that I would see back home. And there's a lot of lopticians here. It's affordable. I think I went to get my hair done. I did wash, dry, style, well, retwist and style, and it was 50 euro. And I really felt taken care of. Mm -hmm. I'm like, maybe my sister would be like, I don't even know. It would probably be double. Yeah, at but, least. Yeah, you'll be able to find anything and everything you want because, like Heather said, there's Black people here from other countries and Black locals, so it's easy. Uh, yeah, it's definitely really easy. Before I got here, I'm kind of crazy. Like, I would scour Instagram for hours just looking through hashtags of, like, Black hair salons in Portugal, Black hair in Portugal, stylists in Portugal, like, because I needed to at least know I had a couple of options for, like, my hair, my nails, this and that before I got here, mm -hmm. and I came with braids, so as soon as I've been getting my hair done literally, like, once a month because it's so cheap, so it's definitely accessible. You might have to go out of your way a little bit or, like, go outside of Lisbon. If you venture outside the city, like, downtown, there's, there's plenty of options for us, and even downtown there are. So one of the questions, and even I had that as well, is finding apartments, finding places to live, but not just finding places to live as in, you know, your apartment, 
but like neighborhood feel and things like that, because unlike the US, uh, Portugal doesn't have like an MLS. So how have you been able to like navigate that? Is it something where you kind of lean on each other in the group or is there like a cheat code I need to know? <laughs> okay, so finding the right neighborhood. When I first came here in Lisbon, I live right down the street, literally oh. right down the street. And I fell in love with this neighborhood, but everyone's like, check out other neighborhoods, check out this neighborhood. And I would go and I'm like, mm, no, mm -mm, too many cars. No, I like where I live at because I like that it's just old people that live here. It's quiet. There's not much going on compared to like Barrio Alto or Castro Soto over there. It's like loud or other areas where it's like cars. It just, it just didn't seem right for me. How I found this place was I was looking on, I think, Ideal Lisa, which is a search, uh, a website to find listings. And I found this place, but I did not have a realtor at the time. But when I found another realtor, this listing for the apartment that I'm in right now was in their system. Oh, okay. um, so I actually got lucky with the realtor that I had because a lot of realtors I've talked to, they, I don't know, it's weird here. Like they don't want to put in the work. It's like, I won't say that they're lazy. I just think that the Portuguese people are just like nonchalant and like, oh, I'll get to it in six months. You know, <laughs> they're not, it's not a rush like, okay, you want this money? You need to yeah. do your job. But the realtor I have now, he's, you know, has been amazing. Any, any issues I've had. Um, kind of what Cam had said, if you know a Portuguese, someone that's Portuguese, they can handle your business. You know, he's helped me with anything I need to help with. Um, he's gone above and beyond and that's helped. So my suggestion is for people that are looking to rent, please ask around, definitely ask them, you know, our community because we're always going to have references or we're always going to have, okay, well, I have this person, but it didn't work out for me, but this person you can use to help find a place. Also, another thing that I suggest is checking your neighborhood out at nighttime, too. Mm. Um, I think that's a really big thing because here the Portuguese come out like late at night. <laughs> After midnight is when they start their, their nightlife. Wow. So if you like quiet and you don't want a lot of sounds from outside, definitely, you know, take a, you know, come out during those hours and see like who's actually hanging outside your neighborhood. To see if it's the best fit for you. And what hidden clubs might be on your block. Yeah, the hidden clubs. <laughs> yes. <Hidden clothes>. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they see something. <laughs> um, so the neighborhood that I'm living in, my same friend who's local Portuguese lives in the neighborhood, and I always tell her that I moved there. It's Algez. So it's the next um, I guess city or municipality mm -hmm. don't quote me but it's a whitish so it's mm -hmm. right outside of Lisbon um and I said we moved to Algez because of our Algez propaganda but <laughs> <laughs> like we're literally right on the water have an ocean view um oh but what's great is we're only a five minute walk from the train so door to door it takes me like 15 minutes to get into downtown Lisbon um and we certainly have more space out there like there's a huge park near us we have like the beachfront, um, like where we can walk. We do like a coastal two kilometer walk during lunch breaks. Um, and also the realtor that I worked with, Heather had recommended. So he certainly went above and beyond the call of duty. Um, but we were also doing our own research on the side as well, just like checking all the sites and like scouring the internet. In fact, the place that we're at, we found, but like he helped us like, secure the lease and set up the equipments and so forth um and it's just again always great to have a local on your side when you're doing these things just to go off of what heather was saying where she was saying how um she feels like the realtors don't want to work i don't think that's fair to say that i've heard that they make more money when people are buying properties so mm -hmm. those people are probably more prioritized than the renters so that could be one possible reason yeah, it could be. I've had, I've reached out to probably like five or six realtors and none of them got back to me. But I was told that the money is where the buying is. So it could be a mixture of both, honestly. I moved four times in like a seven or eight month span. My first place I found at Flat, in Flatio. And then I rented a room and then I rented 
uh, apartment and I finally signed a lease for an apartment for February. So it was good because I was able to move around to different parts of Lisbon. I've lived on just about every single color line except for the red line, lived on the blue line, the green line, now I'm on the yellow line. <laughs> and just being able to see the different neighborhoods. But Heather's right, like at nighttime, you don't really know how these neighborhoods are. They might be busy, you might not like it. And the cool thing about Portugal is you only have to fulfill one third of your lease. So mm -hmm. if you find a place and you don't really like it, sign a year, a year contract, that's what, four months? And it just gives you the opportunity to live in different places. So I would recommend doing like Airbnb if you can afford it. And another thing is unless you have a co-signer, a lot of these places require you to put a lot of money up front. So that's something that you need to be prepared for. I lucked out because I found a co-signer, but they ended up not even requiring one. So all I did was pay for two months of rent up front and wow. a deposit. Most people are paying like six months up front, but it's just remember everything is negotiable. Mm -hmm. So like, Maybe you show them what your investment portfolio is back in the U.S., or you show them different things and you just work with them. But if they ask you for six months of rent up front, be like, no, nah, and give them something else. <laughs> or just, you know, you, and you also have to put bids in for apartments, too. So unless you're in a place that's not really popular, but if you want to be like in the city center, there's probably a lot of applicants trying to get that place as well. So that's something to be mindful of, too. Um, so when I first got here, I started in an Airbnb for like five months. Um, and thankfully, the woman was familiar with, she had a few like occupants that also got their visa. So she was familiar with like having to draft up a formal lease agreement as opposed to just like an Airbnb confirmation. Um, so I started out there. And my plan right now is to actually try out different spots like every five or six months. So I recently moved last month and now I'm in Belém. So I used to be in this neighborhood with Heather as well. Loved it, but when I just kind of want to hop around until I find something or until something feels, feels right. So the spot that I'm in now will be in until about August. And I actually found it through Facebook Marketplace, which could have been a scam, but it wasn't. <laughs> so it could have gone either way. Um, so I would also recommend obviously be very careful and ask the right questions. But um, I found this spot through Facebook Marketplace. Everything ended up working out, formal lease agreement and everything. I think I only had to do like one month up front, which is pretty crazy because I've heard those stories of having to do six months. Um, so I definitely looked out here. Um, and then next I'm looking to try like the Algrab, like somewhere south, completely different. Mm -hmm. Just hop around the country and then land somewhere long term. Wow. I'm someone who put up six months, but that's because mm -hmm. I was competing against offers and I really, really wanted this place. Mm -hmm. So your place is really nice. Yeah. Thank you. I guess the, the peace of mind that I got from paying the rent up front, like I have to pay rent for like the first few months. So it's nice knowing that that's, and then my place came furnished. So yeah, it worked out. That's something that's different for people in the US. Like when you have a house, you're used to like bidding wars and negotiating, but with rent, it's like, it is what it is oftentimes and you just go in. So it's good to have this dialogue around, you know, what the differences and nuances are. So people can go in eyes wide open. You can negotiate your oh, rent. Yeah. Yeah, so negotiate my apartment was, I think I negotiated 75 off of it monthly. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. That's amazing. <laughs> so you can negotiate too, especially if you're signing a longer lease. I signed a three year lease. So oh, I only okay. have to do it a year if I want to. Yeah, yeah. I was literally going to say the same thing that you can negotiate the rent price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I had to pay asking because I was in the little bidding war. I was like, we're going to get this place. <laughs> we're raise the price. <laughs> so I'm happy. No regrets. <laughs> so um, in terms of the digital nomad, you know, there's a lot of conversation around digital nomads, D7 retirement visas. Are any of you working in Portugal or you kind of like taking this time to chill and see all of what it has to offer. I wish, I wish. <laughs> One day. So they would have to answer it. Um, I'm retired, so I don't work at all, but they can elaborate more on. Well, you can speak on your nomad. retired experience. Oh, she said digital nomad. Okay, so. Or retired, because oh. I think I'm going to be retired too, so. <laughs> so I um, retired from the military back in 2017, and I came to Portugal on a D7 retirement visa. 
So I am able to work. Uh, I will be working as a freelancer soon coming up. But outside of that, my days are spent meetings, eating, sleeping, mm -hmm. events, and nightlife. I think that's about it. And maybe 2% sleep in between those mm -hmm. things. And that is not sleep. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I do sleep. It's a little bit. But that's why some of my days, you know, when you don't work, everyone's working during the daytime, so it's not like you can just hang out with people. I mean, sometimes I would go to uh, the co-working spot with Cam mm -hmm. and just hang out there and, like, kind of work on my computer. But, yeah, it's just a very relaxing life, not having mm -hmm. anything to worry about. So I'm doing the Article 15 residency plan because my husband is an EU citizen, and I do not work for a Portuguese company, I work for an American company, but as a contractor. Yeah, I'm on the B7. I was freelancing before I got to Portugal, and then I found a job once I was here for a UK startup. So my story, again, is a little bit different because everyone's like, don't move to Portugal without a job mm -hmm. lined up because it's going to be hard. I think applying for jobs is challenging wherever you are. You just have to be strategic, but it's possible. And I proof of that. She moved here sight unseen. Then you know, know things, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Leap in the network. <laughs> <in the middle. laughs> so I'm also on the B7 visa, and I work for an American company, a marketing agency. Um, they're not international, but they graciously allowed me to work remotely from here. And so my days, I mean, I work East Coast hours, so I work 2 to 10.30 p.m. Um, Lisbon time. So I have the morning and my early afternoon. We go out on long walks with my dog and I, um, and then I clock in. So I wish I was retired, but we're not there quite yet. So we're gonna be on our rich journeys. Yeah. Wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Some people talked about the housing market, which we discussed like briefly, but Lisbon versus Porto. I spent two and a half days in Porto because I knew that was the whole thing. Like, ooh, Lisbon, more expensive, Porto, not as much. But ultimately, it looks like Lisbon is the one that's winning out. Did you have any thought? And, you know, you all don't have to answer. I think it's whoever has um, any uh, information to share on this topic. Was there any point in which Porto was a consideration set? When my my lease for my last place was up, I was like, I might just move to Porto. But the reason why I didn't is because the community there is not like the community here and it's colder. But Porto is a nice city. It's cute. It's affordable. The, the apartments are, are cheaper too, but it doesn't have what Lisbon has. So it's like you get what you pay for, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what ultimately made me to stay in Lisbon. Okay. Yeah, that's how I felt. <laughs> I was especially coming, spending a week here before I went there. And I was just like, oh, I, I just don't feel, I don't feel it yeah. <laughs> is the best way to put it. It's a nice place to visit for a weekend. Oh, yeah. But I think it would get boring over a week. Yes, yes. And then we talked about how to acquire housing, schooling. So Heather, you can speak to this one. What's the schooling situation like, especially coming in a, as an expat? So is it like Portuguese school, uh, international school is an option, private school? How has that interface been for you? So um, just a backstory. I was homeschooling, world schooling, unschooling. Oh, wow. I had my daughter for five years. So when we came to Portugal, I wanted her to be in a school where she can kind of adjust properly. Because when you're world schooling, unschooling, it's kind of, there's no structure really. You just travel the world and you learn, you know, from what's in front of you. The first school that I put my daughter in was a British private school, but it did not have any structure. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of really disappointing because they didn't have, a building it was still being built so they were having classes in like starbucks were in restaurants it was crazy and i did not like it so i ended up looking at other schools the reason why i did not choose international school is because tuition for itself is 1800 euros a month wow that's not tuition that doesn't that's not books uniforms food transportation anything and i said you know that's crazy i'm a single parent here it's not ideal for me to spend over 2000 US dollars on a school. So then I looked at a, another school, a private Portuguese school, one of 
the other women in our community, she was telling me about it. So I went and looked at it and it was amazing. Um, tuition was way more affordable, mm -hmm. under 500 euros wow. uh, a month versus the British private school my daughter was in. I was paying close to 600 euros a month. And my daughter has adjusted extremely well. Um, mm -hmm. It's more, I will say I was very surprised. There were a lot of black kids there. I, I don't like the term black kids, but there were a lot of like in Goldens, mm -hmm. um, people from Cape Verde, all the former Portuguese colonies. You mm -hmm. know, my daughter could go there and feel accepted you know, versus she being the only black black girl there. So I would say the ratio was more people of color than non-people of color. So I really did like that. Um, I also liked how some of the teachers were, well, they spoke English, some of the teachers spoke English, but they were very accommodating to my daughter. My daughter's only American in the school. Uh -huh. uh, the school is taught 100% Portuguese. Her books are in Portuguese, wow. but all her friends speak English. So if they're going over a lesson that the teacher does not speak English, they will help translate or help her uh, with assignments. Uh, another thing I really mm -hmm. loved about the school, my daughter was having like some major tests. They do grades really weird here, um, but everyone else had uh, you know standardized tests, you know questions, mm -hmm. all these different questions. My daughter's test was basically write down everything that you learned in this class. In like a paragraph form. Wow. Not saying it was easier for her, but it did take a lot of the stress off of her mm. because learning history that's not American history and kind of looking at what you learn in America, it's kind of confusing because each country has their own views mm. on who did what and mm. you know. So I really do appreciate that, but um, she loves it. She's out right now with her friends doing something that was meant. That's fantastic. So for someone who is, it sounds like for somebody who is considering coming here as a single parent, they can find the right place for their child. Yes. I think the biggest thing coming here anywhere as a single parent, you have to make connections. You know, you have to talk to people. You have to, at least if you know one person here, they're going to know somebody else that can push you in the right direction. Um, I know some people are just like not on Facebook, not on the internet. That's fine and dandy, but I feel like it's very crucial that mm -hmm. you are connecting somehow, you know. So single parents, I think I know one other single parent here, and her son, I believe, is nine. And she, she said that he seems to be doing well. Mm -hmm. Good. That's fantastic. So I think I'll end on a topic that is one that is on my list of things to tackle mm -hmm. once I move. And that, but I don't talk about often on the podcast. <laughs> and that's dating. <laughs> so I'll give a little bit of my spiel for you, okay. in case you didn't know. So I'm many years divorced and two children, half empty nest. So I've put that off. But coming in this new journey, in this new phase of life, it's going to be dating with intention. So, you know, whether it's me or someone else that's listening to this conversation and it's curious, what's it been like? <laughs> I have had very interesting dating stories and experiences, and you guys know many of them. Um, <laughs> I will say dating Portugal, Lisbon, for me, has not been impossible. I've met some really great people. I've met some weirdos. And mm -hmm. I met people that were not not for me, for mm -hmm. sure. I think you have to go into it with an open mind. And definitely, if you want to date someone and have something long-term or you're looking for marriage or companionship, then you have to be honest right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. If not, people are going to waste your time and you're going to waste their time. Um, I also think that, you know, using dating sites are okay. Like Tinder, Bumble, there's like a few other ones out there are okay. Just to, if you haven't dated for a long time, like me, I was able to realize, okay, these are things I like about a person. These mm -hmm. are things I don't like about a person. So when I meet someone organically, I'm like, oh, wow. These are the things I really liked about her or not like. So, you know, stay with it. Um, another thing I have been doing was going to other countries to look for. <laughs> look for <dating>. Nice. <laughs> um, London. I have to DM you and find out the list. <laughs> London has been calling my name for some reason. I've been like twice in a wow. two-month period, I feel like. Um, but yeah, it's just 
just be intentional, step outside your comfort zone, and um, have fun with it. That's all part of dating. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am married, so I'm not dating here. However, you're dating your husband. I'm dating my husband, <laughs> but like I've been telling him he needs to go out and make friends so that he can make friends who are single so I can introduce them to my friends. Yeah, you go. You know what? You're a good friend. <laughs> and then sometimes when I'm out and about and I see a good looking person, like I want to approach them and be like, hey, are you single? Because I got a lot of single friends, but then I'm like, how do I approach that? That must be like so weird. <laughs> Um, I'm just trying to be a good wing girl. But, yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty easy to date in Portugal. Now, if you're looking for a relationship, that's another thing. Since I got here, like, I was dating people, going on dates, meeting new people. Even before I got to Portugal, I was on Tinder. And, like, I matched with a few people. So, when I got here, I already, like, had some people lined up. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it was nice. It was fun. Like, I think I've had my best dating experiences here. And I've dated people from different countries. I even was in a little relationship that lasted for a <laughs> little thing that lasted for a few months. And yeah, it's, it's never really been a problem for me to meet people. You can meet people on the streets, but it's about meeting someone that is on the same wavelength as you. And I feel like that can be a challenge internationally. But all you really need is to find one person, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an easy city to put yourself out there. And like, you can go to the park, you'll meet somebody. You can walk on the street, you'll meet somebody. You can be at a restaurant by yourself, you can meet somebody. So I love that about Portugal, because in the US, it was really challenging for me to meet people. And I just recently got out of a relationship. So while I can't offer any advice now, if we bring this back in like six months, I might have more stories to share. Hi, girl, summer. Yeah, you know, we outside. It, it's going to be a to be continued. I like that. I like that. I want to thank each and every one of you for your time and your honest conversation today. This is obviously the the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that you know. You all will be doing on your respective journeys here, you know, lighting the path for people like me and so many others that are going to listen to this conversation. So as we close, for those who are curious about moving to Portugal, wanting that connection, wanting that community, how best for them to connect with you all? Definitely the Facebook group, Black in Portugal. You can join it. Um, also, our Instagram page, Black in Portugal, as well. You can reach us on our Instagram, Black in Portugal. We also have a link tree, which we have intake information. If you would like to collab with us or just information about our community, that would be the best way to contact us. But also, we would love to see you in person at some of our events, which we are always posting on our Instagram and our Facebook group, which are held monthly, especially during the summertime. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Blackseat Global Podcast. For more information on today's episode, be sure to visit our website at blackseatglobal.com. It's not only possible to live out your dreams unbothered and in full color, it is your birthright. Are you trying to sort out health plans, banking, VPN, and other connectivity for your move abroad? Well, have no fear. We've got you with the Move Abroad Starter Kit. Get yours today at blacksitglobal.com slash resources. That's blacksitglobal.com slash resources.